welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending our our second session as a as a Carbon Leadership Hub. So um, we're the Carbon Leadership Forum, which is it spans all over the world actually. Um, and we were happy to launch the Alberta Hub just last December officially with our first event. And now we are on to our second. So we're trying to. Um, you can see our mission there. We are co coordinating events that empower industry professionals to radically reduce embodied carbon from buildings and infrastructure. So we're really excited because we feel like this touches on us so many areas, everything from policy to um, uh, structural engineering, architecture and design and, um, and uh, with our builders as well. So um, I wanted to point out our website. We always like to see because we are new and exciting. So of course, uh, if you have any questions about information or upcoming events, you can um, go to the website and you can see we actually have the link for videos there. And that will have uh, videos to our previous events, as well as we've linked up with some of the, um, you know, some of the other hubs have been uh, active for a while. For example, CLF Vancouver. So they've got some interesting videos there um, about all sorts of things about embodied carbon, you know, with mechanical equipment and insulation. And they've got lots of great detailed videos. And then um, I also wanted to point out uh, the Carbon Leadership Forum community also has a website online. So if you're just starting your carbon journey and you're trying to figure out where to start, um, there's, there's probably some people that have answered some or had some of the same questions as you. So you can sign on there and there's um, information by region and by category. You can see there's uh, buildings, constructions, LCA, which we are covering today. EC3 tool, which is an exciting new um, new EPD repository and um, all sorts of uh, information. So you can start there and you can also see us on the regional hubs there. There's Alberta and you can sign up um, through this forum as well. Um, but for the more local information, you can sign up for our newsletters here and then we'll definitely let you know about all the future events. Um, so we are new, if you're interested in volunteering, we're still trying to figure that out. But if you're interested, by all means, please still email us, us, sorry, email us. I know people have, and we really appreciate your patience with that as we try and sort out the next stages of what CLF Alberta looks like. So um, thank you for that. But yeah, we're we are always interested in, in expanding our network. I don't think there's anything else um, right away, but I'll just uh, let our chair, Mehdi, introduce our speaker. Hey. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, welcome, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second online session for CLF Alberta. My name is Mehdi Zahid. I am a registered architect with the Alberta Association of Architects. I am a member of Royal Architecture Institute of Canada, a faculty member at NEAT, uh, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology and Architectural Technology Program based in Edmonton, the capital city of Alberta. Uh, sustainability and uh, respect the in, for the environment uh, is my passion, as well as teaching architecture. It was always my question to learn about sustainable design. I wanted to make functional, energy efficient, architecturally nice building with character and respect for our resilient built environment. During my past 10 years as a faculty at NEET, I had the great privilege to teach architectural technology and make a curriculum for sustainable design. I had to perform research and study to learn about these topics before teaching them. This question was always in the back of my mind, what is sustainability and how should we achieve this locally? To find my answer, I found myself at the University of Calgary School of Architecture Planning and Landscape to continue my education with the Faculty of Graduate Studies. I learned that sustainability has three main areas, including economic, social, and environmental pillars. And I learned that uh, an only elegant design cannot be sustainable if there is not respecting these three pillars. I had to research to ac four accurate tools to measure sustainability and gauge if what we design is truly sustainable. I had to study the fundamental of industrial ecology and wonder around what I had, what I had learned in the past for, to rebuild my fund fundamentals and foundation of thoughts again. 
I was lucky enough to, to meet with the, my supervisor at the start of this journey and learn the tools of industrial ecology, including material flow analysis, life cycle assessment, and input output analysis. Uh, no, I would like to uh, uh, introduce our great uh, speaker, my supervisor today, Dr. Getachu Asifa. Dr. Asifa is an Associate Professor of Sustainable Design at the School of Architectural Planning and Landscape at the University of Calgary. He is the former Athena Chair in Life Cycle Assessment at the Faculty of Environmental Design. His research interests including life cycle sustainability assessment, built environment assessment, industrial ecology, and sustainable consumption. He focuses on the design and development of technical systems, including energy systems, biofuels, and bioenergy, waste management system, and buildings. He teaches courses in life cycle assessment, industrial ecology, architecture, and life cycle thinking, design decision, and global sustainability. He received University of Calgary's Sustainability Award for 2017 for campus as learning laboratory category. Outstanding Teaching Performance Award from the Shulok School of Engineering, University of Calgary in 2015 and 2016. And Green Hero Award from Ethiopia in 2011. His research has been published in well-known journals in his area, such as Journal of Cleaner Products, International Journal of Life Cycle Assessment, Journal of Building and Environment, the Journal of Sustainable Cities and Societies. He has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Addis Ababa University, master's of science in environmental engineering and sustainable infrastructure, and a PhD in industrial ecology from Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. He has over 20 years of teaching and research experience that cover the countries, including Sweden, Canada, Ethiopia, and China. He consults on life cycle sustainability position of products and services. Welcome Getachu to our panel today. It's very privileged for us to have you and the uh, floor is yours. Welcome to our program. Thank you, Mehdi. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let me share. You can hear me, right? Yes, yes, your, your voice is clear. Okay. Okay, uh, let me. Okay, I think you can see that. Yes. Perfect. Th thank you, everyone, uh, for coming uh, today. And I would be going behind uh, the LCA results. I will be taking you there and uh, we'll be talking about some uh, fundamentals there. And then I will also go beyond the results. So where the results are being used, uh, the way they are used right now, and the way I see them uh, being used uh, increasingly in the future. So my slides will be uh, too much technical in some cases, and uh, I wouldn't be spend a lot of time on them uh, so that we have this discussion question and answer later so that I would drill in if there is a need to do that. Okay, so the fundamentals. So the perspective I have is, I mean, we, you can talk about LC of everything from food to the session we are in now, you know, the LCA of having this session. We can do that as well, right? Or a Christmas tree or a jumbo jet or a building. So my lens for today would be buildings. So in buildings, we are interested to know the impact of materials, energy, transportation, all that, and the end of life of these materials, where they are sourced from, and so on. And basically, uh, in LCA, if we are going to do it the way the standard way of doing LCA is done uh, based on the ISO standard from 2006. 
uh, we have four phases of doing that. So we have the qualitative phase in terms of goal and scope definition, where you define, obviously, as the name implies, the scope, the goal, the reason for doing it, the system boundary, and so on. And once you are done with your tool, uh, with your uh, calculations, it's running over, uh, you will make sense of the results. So in terms of which of the materials are most important, which transportation, which life cycle stage, and so on. Between this goal and scope definition and interpretation, you have the two quantitative phases. So I would be talking more on these two uh, because that's where the fundamental of uh, LCA lies. But as you could see, the uh, two arrows everywhere show that it's not a linear process. It's not like, you know, you start with goal and scope definition, and after three months, you are done with the interpretation. It's, you know, every time you do uh, the study, it's an iterative process. You go back and forth to uh, modify, update, and so on, based on knowledge uh, that hopefully increases during the work of the LCA, but also based on data availability, uh, based on uh, changes in scope, and so on. In terms of LCA, the keyword or phrase is the life cycle perspective. So going from cradle to cradle, or if you are not looking at the uh, closing the material loop or reuse, recycling and so on, cradle to grave. But of course that will depend on the scope of the study. So not all LCS are full life cycle, so to speak, as we will see later. But this is, you know, a kind of poster child of this presentation today. So I'll coming and be coming back and forth to this one. So let's spend some time here. So this is where you could see that a full life cycle of a building, if it's really full life cycle, it covers all the 16 modules. So from A1 to D, or from somewhere where the material is extracted, transported, you know, the building is set up, installed, and you operate the building for, let's say, 50, 60 years. At the end of life, you demolish, deconstruct it, and so on. And depending on what you do with the waste, the demolition waste, uh, you can have another second life in a different product, in a different building, and so on. So the scope definition is also about defining clearly which of these are covered in the LCA of interest. And if you look at, at the top of this, uh, you could see that there are groups that, group names that we use. So we call these first five modules, the embodied impact, initial embodied impact. That's why we have the, uh, the CLF focusing on embodied carbon. So. These are the initial embodied impacts associated with the material uh, all the way until they are installed in the building. But then, you know, in a building, you would have repair, replacement, and so on. Then you will have additional recurrent embodied impacts related to the fabric. And at the end, you can also account for the embodied impact associated with the end of life of the building. Of course, uh, the system boundary, you can uh, have a number of terminologies to uh, talk about that. The so cradle to cradle is the most comprehensive of all because it covers all these 16, but you can have cradle to gate. So if you are a manufacturer, as we will see later, your, your business would be more on A1 to A3. So the product stage. When you have an LCA done A1 to S3 and you, ship that with your LCA study, then you know whoever is picking your material will be looking at what you have from A1 to S3. So you'll be more on the cradle to get one. So you can see you know uh, all this going to different levels of coverage. So at the end of the day, what we want to do in LCA is calculate these metrics, these materials, these uh, measures, uh, measures and so on. So the most common, widely known, even you know, it's uh, nowadays, if you Google for it, you'd, it's not uncommon to find 
uh, you know, just daily news reporting on CO2 equivalent or carbon dioxide equivalent. What we are talking about is just calculating the life cycle based on the scope into these units that uh, represent whatever environmental problem we want to cover. So these numbers could be small or, you know, most comprehensive, again, depending on your goal and scope. So for what purpose are you doing the LCA? We'll uh, clearly define which one of these to include and uh, how uh, detailed. Talking about CLF, this is uh, one of the uh, reviews done uh, compiling uh, over 1,000 buildings from uh, different parts of the world. And I want to just bring your attention to the y-axis. So here you see, it's talking about CO2 equivalent. So this is one of you know, the metrics that we saw in the previous slide. So basically what we are seeing here is, it's jumping uh, to the next one. So it's representing all these buildings of different types um, and different scope as well in terms of what is included in the buildings but in the same unit, CO2 equivalent. So basically the question now is taking you behind the LCA calculation, what is making up the CO2 equivalent? So what we do basically in LCA is just make an inventory of emissions, whether you use a tool, you know, a kind of user-friendly tool or uh, an Excel-based tool. At the end of the day, what you are doing is just inventory of the emissions to air, to soil, to water, and different types of raw material extraction from nature. And this forms the basis for calculating the impact units that we saw before. So in your climate change case, uh, some of these emissions that you make an inventory of make up the final CO2 equivalent number, a single number for climate change. And we use methods that are uh, uh, helpful in calculating this inventory into these impact category units. By the way, uh, feel uh, you know, free to interrupt uh, if we want to have uh, an interactive session instead of maybe waiting for the final uh, end of the presentation. So a more detailed and a zoom into that. So whether it's materials, energy, transport, you know, across the board, what you are doing is making, knowing the quantity of that input into your LCA. So from transport, it's about how much you are transporting and how far. Then that will uh, trigger, let's say the fuel, the emissions, all that, that will be helpful in calculating your CO2 equivalent. The same for energy, how much kilowatt hour of what type of energy are we talking about? The same with materials, what material, how much, and so on. Then that will give out these uh, units and the total of the emissions associated with that. If you are talking about impact uh, in terms of emissions or resource flows in terms of how much, you know, raw uh, material are we talking about in terms of resource depletion also there. Then what will happen is once you have this inventory ready, uh, the system or the LCA is just having these characterization factors, or you can call them conversion factors, convert into the same unit. Because when you have here, you have you know uh, some substance contributing to the same impact, but then they are of different units. You cannot add them, but with the help of these characterization factors, you can do that. Just a uh, a glimpse of what they look like. So you have, for example, thousands of, I mean, in the case of some impact categories, really thousands of substance contributing. But in the case of, let's say, climate change, you have over 100 of them. So each of them have, based on natural science mechanisms, uh, characteristic factors assigned to them. So this is not subject to discussion or political decision. Uh, this is based on natural science modeling. So the amount of emission 
that's invented you know in the um, system is multiplied by the corresponding character factors to get this single number so when you saw that slide from clf on these over thousands of buildings uh, 1000 buildings uh, having the same unico equivalent is basically doing the materials considered any transportation associated you know whatever is in defined the system boundary and calculating everything into these units so i'm you know taking you like i said to behind uh, the numbers that we see and so on and if you are looking at material uh, you know details so it's about you want to know how much material and which type of material defining which type of material will come with this uh, data on how impactful is that material so always in lca we talk about is it good to have a concrete structure versus steel structure or wooden structure right so that is about you know what you have in terms of the impact intensity per unit of steel uh, wood and concrete and so on so once all this is taken together, uh, you see the amount of material, uh, if you are over designing it, or if you are, you know, in, in some case, designing it to, uh, uh, to the required specification, then there is an opportunity for uh, uh, reducing the impact. So it's both about choosing the material type, but also by looking at uh, the dematerialization opportunities as well. So the same for, you know, if you are doing it assembly by assembly, some of the tools that we'll see, uh, for example, the most known in North America is Athena Impact Estimator. It does it assembly by assembly. Then what's behind the scene in the tool is a database that uh, calculates the impact per uh, unit of assembly, if you will. So basically what we are doing is aggregating the individual impacts uh, to the total impact, the, the material aspect of the building. The same with energy. So operational energy, energy is a critical element in uh, buildings, uh, given that one, the buildings last for you know, a significant uh, number of years, uh, but also most of still in most of uh, most parts of the world uh, the energy type we have whether it's electricity you know for heating and so on are uh, impact intensive so uh, they are carbon intensive uh, and so on so this intensity of impact intensity of the energy source usually is in the database that you use in the tools and then the user input would be on how much uh, energy and what type of energy or fuel are you using to uh, heat, cool, or power the building? Talking about softwares, um, we have a number of them, some of them commercial, some of them generic. Uh, so you can use them for, like I said, for calculating the impact of this today's session or the impact of, you know, a full life cycle impact of a building. Some are specialized, uh, for example, Tali and Athena Impact Simulator, they specialize on uh, buildings. So building materials and building, whole building assessment, you can carry with Tali, Athena Impact Simulator and B as well. I'll be talking briefly on this. So what is important uh, is always the data. So you have to have primary data, if you are making, you know, decisions that would inform, let's say, design decisions in design offices, uh, or if you are just want to understand the, you know, over the envelope uh, way of how the building is performing and so on, you can tap into generic data, you know, average data in databases and so on. But at the end of the day, it's always about uh, garbage in, garbage out. So Athena Impact Estimator, uh, it's for free. You can you know, download it from this uh, website and it's North American. Uh, that's to say what's behind it in the back end 
is based on North American cities. You can uh, choose Calgary, for example, from the tool and get you know, your input in terms of material and energy. Uh, so how much material uh, by assembly, for example, uh, and then you have the energy also uh, coming in. Then the impact intensity of the energy and the impact intensity of the uh, materials, uh, even the transportation distance is uh, behind the scene. I mean, in the back end specific for that location. And which is helpful. And uh, that way, you know, you can generate the impact uh, measures that we talked about earlier. So what's covered in the, the uh, Athena impact meter. So like I said, this is our uh, figure, go to figure uh, or uh, description. So it covers from A1 to D. So depending on your input, uh, you can uh, have A1 to D covered in the Athena impact meter. Basically you are covering the embodied impact as well as the operational impact of your building and any uh, credits that could be earned from recycling, recovering is also accounted there. If you are using Tally, uh, I, I saw Christy uh, sh showing the pull down menu. Uh, there was Tally as well there. So Tally is also another uh, important tool. And the big advantage uh, when compared to Athena Impact Meter is the fact that you can connect Tally to your uh, B model. So in this case, Revit. So you can have you know, your Revit model ready for a different purpose and then add on Tally in Revit. And then you know, the material with some uh, tweaking here, the material aspect, everything is transferred to Tally for an LCA calculation. So you can add on top of that the operational energy the, if you want to edit the average you know, transportation considered there, you can also do that within Tally and then get your result uh, in terms of a report that you can use for different purposes. And this is uh, the Tally system boundary. So you could see that B1, for example, is not covered uh, and B7 is not covered, C1 is not covered and so on. So, uh, but as we'll see later, What's covered is important, for example, for lead or for other purposes that you want to, to use in terms of uh, getting your building certified uh, and so on. So it covers the fundamentals of the embodied impact. Uh, it covers the uh, building fabric uh, and what's happening uh, upstream and so on. So, I mean, in terms of material, uh, if you are a material manufacturer, you want, of course, to have the least impactful material delivered to the construction site. Uh, and design offices downtown, you know, they look at material, the material specifiers in design offices are looking for, you know, uh, uh, impact, less impact or low impact, for example, low carbon uh, cement low carbon concrete, steel, and so on. So what they're basically looking is the A1 to A3. But of course, like I said, if you are a building manager and you are managing a number of buildings, you know, downtown and so on, uh, you might be interested as well to look at the recurring material input. Uh, and then you can also look at, you know, the B1 to B5. So these are still materials, but happening during the uh, operational life uh, time of the building. So, so far it was about, you know, going behind and seeing what is, uh, how is it being calculated? So I want to go to the beyond the results. Where are these results helpful uh, right now and maybe in the near future as well. So one of the clearer uh, usage of life cycle results is the lead certification. So this is just a table of content uh, uh, screenshot of the lead uh, document. So there are two areas where the life cycle results or life cycle comes in. One is the obvious life cycle impact reduction uh, credit. 
and the other is the use of environmental product declarations. So in the life cycle impact reduction credit, uh, you can get about four, uh, up to four uh, uh, points just for having a, a whole building life cycle assessment. Then, you know, depending on whether you are showing a reduction uh, will, will also give you additional uh, points. So you could see at the bottom, uh, I don't have the 12, you know, impact metrics I showed you because the lead zooms in into six of them. So they are saying that you can get points uh, if your life cycle assessment calculation uh, covers these, but not all six are necessary to get points. Uh, they make the uh, provision that you should cover uh, climate change and then uh, others from the six. So what's important in uh, the lead is uh, it's a comparative LCA, if you will, because they want to, I mean, for the additional points, you have to have a reduction of certain uh, amount. And that reduction is, it could go from 5% up to 20%. So if you go to 20%, then you get the maximum. And uh, this uh, com comparative uh, reduction is based on first global warming potential and additional to from the six I showed you. So whether you use Athena impact estimator or tally, uh, at the end, when you make the calculations, uh, if you show a reduction of five, you'll get two points. If you are just doing, you know, the LCA, uh, you will get uh, still one point. That's a minimum and so on. And the lead version 4.1 coverage is, you don't have to cover everything. Uh, of course, if you see uh, the system boundaries that are covered or required to be covered, it does cover a significant part of, you know, these 60 modules. Uh, but there are still uh, significant parts that are uh, excluded. So basically what it's saying is about the material. It's about the material choice. Uh, it's about the end of life. It's about the embodied impact and so on. The second um, where life cycle assessment in, uh, comes into uh, the lead system is through the environmental product declarations. Why? Because environmental uh, product declarations are nothing but life cycle based uh, performance declarations of materials, energy, or whatever product we are talking about. So what's unique about EPDs or environmental product declarations is that one, it's like I mentioned life cycle based, uh, but it's also verified and registered document. So it's not like self claim. Uh, it should be independently verified uh, and registered. Uh, and the whole idea of that is about getting it, you know, a transparent way of communicating performance based on life cycle assessment. And each EPD or environmental product declaration uh, is based on what you call a PCR. So a single PCR that sets the rule of doing the life cycle assessment the rule of reporting it in an APD and including, you know, what content uh, should be there in the APD uh, is set in the PCR. So it's about rules, requirements and guidelines. So you, you can see between the PCR, how it's developed and how the APD comes out of the PCR uh, and how APD is based on LCA. There is a lot of uh, standard to follow, including the ISO 14,025 and the ISO 14,040 and 44 for LCA uh, in reporting APDs. So the lead system, uh, again, goes to the same list of impact metrics. So to the sixth one. So it provides point by point, you know, what you could get uh, when you cover this and uh, in terms of the uh, uh, how many products should have EPDs for uh, and so on. So if you are a manufacturer, 
like I said, UEPD would be the A1 to S3. If you are a design uh, company or a consultant and your material specifier would be looking uh, materials that have an EPD covering at least A1 to S3. So it's going, you know, from the raw material extraction, how it's transported to the manufacturer, and then how it's manufactured. So leaving the manufacturer's gate. And this is, you know, just to give you an idea, an extraction from an EPD of a cement. So it's basically reporting on you know, these metrics that we saw before and talking about per ton of cement, how much, and you could, you could see that A1 to S3. So it's covering, you know, what we saw, the three first modules of uh, the life cycle of the material. And depending on what kind of cement, you know, the whole idea of EPD is if you compare different EPDs and if the, they are defined in the same way, you would see that not all cements are the same. Uh, for example, this is Richmond cement from uh, BC compared to the average. You could see there is uh, at least 14% to, uh, I mean, 13% uh, reduction for Richmond based on the uh, Canadian uh, industry average. So, like I said, if you are a material specifier, uh, you want to look at these numbers. And uh, right now, the Canadian government is interested on promoting low carbon assets uh, through NRC and so on. So the whole idea of that is uh, having well-grounded EPDs uh, serving as the base for uh, material purchase, at least for public projects and so on. And um, a part of the EPD as well is the material composition or the product composition, because that would de decide what is the impact result that's reported in the APD. And this is for concrete. You could see that, for example, uh, this is from, uh, you know, just as an example, it can go as low as, you know, 214 to highest 317. Uh, so you have the, in the, the industry average, and it will depend on how much fly ash there is, you know, how much, um, whether there is with air or without air and so on. So this is simply one impact metrics. You have, you know, the rest of that there as well, depending on um, the minimum and the maximum and so on. So the whole idea of EPDs is to provide this transpar transparent way of communicating uh, the performance based on a life cycle perspective. And the lead, coming back to the lead, how the EPDs are used, uh, depending on you know the number of products in the building and how much they cover in terms of cost it gives you from you know uh, uh, varying points so you can get one point for having uh, an LCA and what kind of LCA as well uh, based on the APD so is it internally reviewed or externally reviewed so are the externally reviewed then you get you know the uh, uh, quality higher, uh, and so on. The last uh, section uh, for my presentation is on the zero carbon building standards. So this is a relatively new development. Uh, so this is standard looking at if a building wants, uh, I mean, if a building owner or developer wants uh, their building to be zero carbon uh, certified, um, there is a specification to meet and so on. So again, this is LCA based, covering the same and so on. So this is our building at uh, the University of uh, Calgary, uh, a repurposed building from an old library tower, which is around 40 or plus years old. Now getting this new, uh, actually this figure, this picture is a bit older, but it's getting this uh, new skin and uh, one of the goals is to get zero carbon uh, certification. And the system boundary again is covering uh, the A1 to A5, that the embodied, the initial embodied impact of the building. Uh, and it also covers from B1 to B5. So if you are looking at uh, zero carbon, but full life cycle, 
B6 should also be covered. But if it's embodied impact, uh, per, you know, certification, it should cover uh, what you are seeing in these uh, golden uh, boxes. EPDs, you can, you know, uh, among others, you can get uh, publicly available EPDs for different products in these uh, registries, uh, from international to Canadian specific uh, and so on. And my conclusion is this one word. Whether it's, you know, doing LCA for informing your design decision or getting just an idea on the over the envelope uh, performance or whether it's about you know improving your manufacturing process so that you get a low carbon low impact uh, material or you know even greeting greening the grid because energy is a, a big impact in all this is about data data availability data uh, quality uh, and so on that's why you know between all these stakeholders uh, it's uh, important to come together and just focus on your area and then develop uh, quality data, make it available so that the modular nature of the system boundary would help in terms of bringing everything together for a full uh, and better life cycle performance uh, calculation. I thank you. I'm uh, ready for questions, comments, and so on. Thank you very much, Ketachu. Uh, if anybody has a question, you can type it in the question box or the chat box. If you want to unmute yourself and ask the questions directly, that, that's possible as well, because the number of attendees is controllable. Last time we had more people. Uh, but uh, it is possible if you want to um, unmute yourself and talk. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Getachu, for the very comprehensive and um, very brief information about the life cycle assessment. Um, I wanted to ask first question myself, uh, how the producers, the material producers in the province of Alberta need to um, tackle the climate change by providing more EPDs or more accurate EPDs in the market? Is it something that you seen it in the horizon coming to the province of Alberta? And uh, if yes, how people should do that? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, Mehdi. Yeah, so, so the whole idea of, you know, whether it's for, for example, if you are on, a, you know, if I have a wood manufacturer, I produce that for not only buildings, but for other products as well, for furniture and so on, right? So there should be a merit of, you know, seeing where the market is signaling now, because compared to 10 years ago, so I came to the University of Calgary in 2009. So I can you know, clearly see that 2009 was totally different in terms of you know, all these issues, aspects and so on. So I came from Europe where already in 2009, things were at advanced stage. Uh, so with time, what we are seeing is there is an increase uh, need for um, supplying, like I said, for example, the government of Canada is um, having this low carbon uh, buildings or assets in general, including infrastructure. So if I'm a manufacturer in Alberta, I want to be up to speed in terms of supplying to contractors, you know, builders, who would be uh, definitely subscribing into this, uh, you know, federal initiative. And to do that, you know, you can't do it overnight. So it takes time. So starting early would be uh, my, my advice because uh, if you are focusing on A1 to A3 as a manufacturer, uh, and if you so far have no clue on the details of where your raw materials are coming from, it will take time, specifically if you are in our big company and you are also importing materials from overseas and not all countries or suppliers are, you know, playing, you know, based on, according to the, the rule of the game and so on. So um, it's, you know, good to start early on, identify your suppliers, get them engaged 
Uh, and what, well, what would happen in terms of transport and manufacturing could be closer to home. Uh, then you have more control, you have more you know, uh, opportunity for high quality data and so on. So start somewhere. Like I said, there are databases out there, even uh, some of them freely available there. So you can uh, start with what is available and tweak it to reflect your own uh, situation. Thank you so much. I would pass it to uh, Christine to please uh, conduct the questions from the audience, if you please. Sure, I think that's a great segue when you're just talking about those, uh, 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 sorry, information about what's available for products. One of the first questions is, what are some of the best sources of data about embodied carbon? So I, I'm not sure, I guess it's not projects, pro or sorry, products specifically, but just data on embodied carbon in general. Okay. So uh, first of all, about, uh, you know, uh, three database uh, and closer to home to North America is the, the US LCI. So the US LCI is uh, um, a bit now older uh, project uh, with Canadian and uh, US American uh, stakeholders. So it's uh, hosted by the, now the, it's called the LCA Commons. So it's between the um, National uh, Renewable Energy Lab. I, I can provide, you know, to uh, you guys and you can send to your uh, list. Uh, so the USLCI is what comes to mind as a free, uh, you know, accessible da database that you can use for calculating embodied carbon and other embodied impacts. If you are looking at building specific, uh, again, I will go to the Athena Impact Estimator. It's for free. Uh, and you can, you know, put your materials assembly by assembly or part of, you know, the assembly and so on. And then it gets calculated automatically and it will clearly show what is embodied and what is operational as well, which is helpful. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That's I think very comprehensive. So information at those first websites you mentioned in the LCA Commons and then product specific, maybe I, I think things like EC3 come to mind. And it looks like Donna, thank you for your question. You're asking for the web link. So yeah, we can absolutely provide those. And then just a reminder to everyone that they are on the, the Carbon Leadership Forum website that uh, the community website I was showing earlier. So we can send that link as well and it, it will cover all those um, all those databases. And the next question could not be more timely from Sean, uh, wondering about how much uptake there is in producing EPDs in the concrete industry and in carbon reducing improvements in concrete um, construction. So before uh, we get to your answer, I'm going to quickly show you our next event on April 22nd, which is going to talk about exactly that, implementing EPDs, a cement case study in Alberta. So that's our next, um, our next topic coming up. So um, I'm gonna encourage you to attend that one as well, but uh, we'll wait for, for of course, a response. Uh, actually, I don't have maybe to respond to that. This <laughs> wait for the next event. Yeah, so uh, yeah, my answer would be concrete, uh, cement and so on. These are the uh, four, at the forefront, I would say, in terms of uh, the EPD uptake, LCA and so on. Partly uh, for the reason that I mentioned, like, you know, projects like the uh, low carbon assets at the federal level, but also the fact that concrete and cement are one of these, uh, the bad guys in the room in terms of carbon and so on. So uh, for those who are not in the know, uh, so for most materials, it's about the energy use for most. Uh, energy intensive uh, makes it, you know, carbon intensive automatically because of the grid and so on. But for concrete and cement, it's also about the process itself. So there is a process emission by when you produce cement, the uh, calcination, I'm a chemical engineer, so I have to talk about chemicals. So a calcination process that releases carbon dioxide, uh, I mean, a significant amount of carbon dioxide. So the whole idea of low carbon and so on, uh, is about either to have low carbon cement and uh, concrete or replace them with wood and so on. So there is already an incentive for them to be on the forefront. So the table I showed you is from the 
uh, concrete manufacturers association producing you know average and you know specific uh, EPDs for you know different types of concrete and so on. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. And then of course, yeah, we're hopefully see you all on April 22nd to learn, uh, learn more about that with Climate Earth. Um, the next question is from John. He says, thank you very much for, yes, a great presentation. Um, LCA professionals and architects designers each play different important roles in integrating LCA, sorry, LCI, LCIA data into the decision-making process. How do you see design software that integrates non-geometric metadata into geometric digital models improving from when they first entered the market, tally, one-click, et cetera? How, uh, how I see them developing? Yeah, I think how, how you see the models improving from when they first entered the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, see, I see a great uh, improvement. I, we use them in our uh, in my teaching as well. So when I started teaching LCA related to buildings, you know, it's a long time, a long time ago, they never existed, I, I mean, to start with. And from the time they uh, come in and um, now I see a lot of improvement uh, in terms of the uh, integration. Even, you know, we have been pushing um, myself personally and others for Athena Impact Simulator to go that way as well, because it's a very great tool but right now you can't, you know, automatically transfer the geometric data or other data, you know, there is no automation, so to speak. Uh, so that automation is great. And the risk, however, is sometimes, you know, we rely on or, or over rely on such automations and we don't question, you know, what's coming behind that and so on. So again, it's coming to that data uh, issue. So, you, you get results, but how specific and how relevant are they? That's the question. So with Tali, for example, it's not a lot you can do what's behind it. The same with Athena. So there is, uh, you know, you trust what is behind it, but you don't have control. Whereas if you go to CIMA Pro, Gabi, all these, you know, other commercial, uh, even free ones, open LCA, uh, you can access what you know, in the back end, and you can adjust it to uh, whatever fits your uh, situation. So I, I see, you know, promising uh, development in that regard, but with caution. Excellent. Got some great feedback. So thank you. And uh, thank you for the questions. Any, any others? Last chance to throw them in the chat. Yeah, if you, if you come up with a question, you know, one week from now, I provided my email there. So yeah, it's to be continued. Great. Um, I'll just stop sharing and then send, uh, send that information about the carbon leadership. And then that should at least link you to, um, to all of the, uh, the backup information about EC3 and tool tally. And, and so you can see a little bit more information about all these uh, items that we're talking about. So I'll just link that in the chat right now. Make sure it's going to everyone. So yeah, hopefully I know, I know I went on a journey when you're trying to figure out what tools to use and what's best for you. And you know, we didn't have a Revit license and that changed things. And, uh, things like that. So hopefully that forum or and this discussion uh, can help help you choose the right tool and and uh, have a successful life cycle assessment. All right, I think that's it for now. We are on time, which is amazing. And I think we'll just encourage everyone to keep checking out our websites and and our social media. And uh, again, we look forward to seeing everyone on April twenty second to learn about uh, cement EPDs. Thank you very much everyone for participation for tonight's uh, mm -hmm. presentation. Thanks Getachu again for a wonderful presentation. Please stay in contact, follow us on social media, LinkedIn and uh, Instagram. We would be more than happy to hear from you. If you have any um, topic in your mind, please let us know. And we would uh, do our best to bring the local sustainable experts in the field to uh, have uh, the presentation for our community in beautiful Alberta. Great, thank you guys.
Thank you so much, Ketachu. Enjoy yeah, everyone. Bye, everyone. For, bye now. Uh, I should I should maybe say that uh, the logo behind me is designed by Mary. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for uh, introducing that. This is uh, this is my privilege to to do it. <laughs>